Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 26 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. In earlier discussions, starting with lecture 1 onward, we, we primarily focused on how the earthquakes are coming into picture, primarily related to the movement which is happening along the plate boundaries, following to that there will be development of stresses along the plate boundary and subsequently there will be development of stresses in intraplate regions also. As a result, there has been occurrence of earthquakes not only confined to the plate boundaries, but even to the intraplate regions as can be evidenced from microzonation as well as seismic zonation maps of the country. Then later on we discussed about how to quantify a particular fault plane primarily in terms of its strike value, its dip value and its rack angle which is basically indication of during a particular earthquake what are the direction in which the hanging wall and foot wall are undergoing movement. So, to describe that particular movement, uh, rack angle is important to describe the orientation of fault plane, strike and dip values are important. Then later on we discuss whenever there is release of energy during a particular earthquake, this energy in terms of seismic waves will propagate primarily through the crystal medium and as it is moving from the source which we have also discussed more precisely in terms of uh, synthetic ground motion development as well as modeling of uh, ground motion prediction equation. So, there we discussed about how a particular source whether you are talking about a point source or you are talking about a finite source can be modeled using precisely the shear modulus of the soil then taking into account how much is the stress drop before and after a particular earthquake. Now, the when the seismic waves are generated at a particular source and are getting propagated through a propagating medium, these are interacting with different layers of the earth, primarily the heterogeneity which is present in a particular medium. As a result, whatever the frequency content of the wave generated at the source, these will undergo lot of attenuation, amplification. As a result, the, the ground motion characteristics, primarily the duration, the frequency content and the amplitude of ground motion which was generated at the source will keep on changing throughout its propagation medium. So, that means, if there is a source located at a particular location, then this particular source will be interacting with the medium. So, that particular source will be basically interacting with the medium. If this is your epicenter of the earthquake, once the wave is propagating at deeper deeper locations and away from your epicenter. So, we are talking about away from epicenter or away from focus more specifically. These waves or disturbances are basically interacting with the medium properties in the crystal medium which is located maybe 15, 20 kilometer beneath the ground surface and depending upon the heterogeneity present in the medium, present in the medium there will be change in the frequency content, amplitude as well as the duration of the motion. Depending upon the type of wave generated at the source, Primarily, we will be having body waves which consist of primary wave as well as secondary wave. When these waves interact with surficial and near surface medium, there will be development of surface waves which are coming into existence. So, depending upon the type of wave and its interacting with interaction with the medium, there will be always some change in the characteristics of motion. So, all these parameters the amplitude, the frequency content and duration these are basically the ground motion characteristics which we have already discussed in earlier lectures. So, ground motion characteristics generated at the source subsequently is getting modified as you are moving away from your focus depending upon the heterogeneity again depending upon the geometric spreading, heat or particle oscillation which is happening all across the propagation medium. Finally, the wave, the, the modified wave which has been altered significantly between the source and beneath a particular site of interest, 
that will again get amplified, deamplified by different layers of soil available between bedrock medium and the surface medium. Remember surface medium is the same medium on which any kind of construction of building, any other uh, utilities are generally constructed. So, finally, the, the further modified ground motions at the ground surface are basically responsible for whether the building will undergo minor damage, the building will not undergo any kind of damage or building will undergo complete collapse. So, that will be governed by how much is the ground motion available at the ground surface. But if we look into a particular site of interest, more or less the damage or the level of expected ground motion at a particular location will be collective effort of how much is the bedrock motion because bedrock motion is significantly affected by what are the uh, faults available in and around of that particular region or we can say how much is the seism activity of seismotectonic province of a particular site. Then depending upon that seismic uh, activity of the province and taking into account how much is the magnitude of the earthquakes happening at different different faults within your seismotectonic province one can determine the seismic hazard values. Primarily, it is determined at bedrock level and many a times even at site class A, site class B conditions. So, site class A and site class B are basically referring to the conditions of seismic site classes which are basically based on primarily the 30 meter average site classification which is also discussed in earlier lectures. So, one is the, the level of motion which has been transferred from the source to the bedrock medium. Secondly, how much modification further is happening because of local soil. So, collectively because of these two things, there will be lot many parameters which are coming into picture and having each of these component in terms of controlling the expected level of ground shaking at a particular site of interest. When I say expected level, that means there is not just one scenario which is going to get generated, but there will be number of combinations. Uh, related to maybe higher amplification, maybe lower amplification, higher value of hazard, lower value of hazard. Similarly, when the ground motion has reached to a particular site of interest, depending upon the in situ properties of the soil, the soil may undergo amplification, it may not undergo amplification. So, if we re recollect whatever we discussed in terms of uh, assessing the liquefaction potential of a particular site, again the site may be potential to undergo liquefaction depending upon how much is the in situ strength and how much is it is exposed to a particular ground motion during a particular scenario earthquake. So, we had hazard values at bedrock level, secondly what is the classification at a particular site, thirdly depending upon the classification whether there will be more amplification, there will be less amplification for a particular ground motion, thirdly once the modified ground motion reaches to a particular site of interest how much is the potential of particular site to undergo liquefaction. Similarly, if we are talking about some sites which are very close uh, uh, to uh, coastal regions, then because of earthquake occurrence there can be generation of tsunamis also. So, again we have to find out how much potential a region is in terms of occurrence of tsunami or exposure to tsunami. Same way if we are talking about some hilly terrain because of this modified ground motion, what are the chances that the area which is hilly terrain can experience may be landslides. So, again susceptible to landslide one has to take into account and subsequently, so it is like depending upon where your site is actually located, there might be some chances of induced effects depending upon the terrain type we one is dealing with. So, to start with, so seismic microzonation which we will be discussing in today's class, it is basically a term which will help in microzoning or identifying smaller smaller zones in a particular region it may happen may be to larger area it may happen to maybe one particular construction site also. So, basically the objective of uh, doing microzonation studies which are primarily uh, limited to urban uh, centers. So, here we will be identifying basically the location within urban center within a particular city which are more prone to earthquake hazard uh, and its induced effects. So, it is like when we are discussing about hazards, we will be characterizing a particular region based on the contours of hazard values. Similarly, on the other hand when we are talking about soil amplification because of the presence of local soil, 
again independently we were talking about how much is the amplification which is going to be experienced by a particular site during a particular earthquake. So, hazard value was independent, local side effect was independent. Similarly, if you are discussing about liquefaction potential, potential, then again liquefaction potential of a site considering different different values of scenario earthquakes. But if you take a particular site, whether it is because of high amplification at bedrock level or because of high uh, surface motion or primarily because of very low value of factor of safety, the site may undergo like, uh, damage which may be uh, related to earthquake induced effects. So, collectively in microzonation what we try to do, we try to um, understand collectively based on all the scenarios that means based on bedrock values, based on induced effect, based on local side effect, based on landslide, based on any other induced effect which, which is uh, prone to happen at a particular site of interest and taking all those effects in a rational manner like whether bedrock will be more contributing to surface hazard, whether amplification will be contributing more to hazard or whether the factor of safety against liquefaction or landslide is corresponding more to hazard at a particular site of interest. That means, uh, how much is the hazard expected at a particular site of interest. So, collectively using all those parameters in rational manner and clubbing the contribution which is coming from each of these components, we can get an idea about what are the locations which are relatively safer, what are the locations which are relatively vulnerable. If, if we bring again into uh, uh, the exposure period and uh, building classification and the risk involved, we can go continue with this for uh, vulnerability and risks studies also. So, microzonation in the end will give you some map of a particular study area where you can you can have an understanding what are the regions which are more prone to hazards during a particular earthquake in general. So, not actually not related to one seismic scenario, but related to all the seismic scenario which are primarily taken in uh, bedrock hazard level, soil amplification and liquefaction potential assessment and, and many more induced effects. So, it will help basically in identifying what are the regions in a particular study area which are more uh, which are prone to more hazard and what are the region which are relatively less prone to hazards. This will also help in uh, uh, maybe city planning, maybe laying of important roads, important transmission towers, maybe for uh, uh, site selection for uh, uh, rehabilitation camps, hospitals because in case there is an earthquake or there, there are casualties or calamity which have been uh, spread all across your study area, then seismic microzonation study based uh, maps can be referred in selecting the sites which are relatively safer as far as uh, rehabilitation works are required or maybe some relief works are required to, to settle the affected area. Similarly, as far as transmission uh, is concerned, so again location of transmission tower should be relatively on safer location such that even though the surrounding area is uh, subjected to large of uh, casualties, but still the transmission tower is at relatively safer position. So, that you can pass on the information in case of any distress or anyone requires medical emergency or so on and so forth. So, again for such locations whether you are talking about location of important buildings, important buildings such as uh, uh, schools which can be used even as relief camps in case of any distress may be transmission towers, transmission towers, may be for laying of, laying of important roads. The entire area has undergone damage that means even the connection of road networks has also been affected. So, what are the important roads which may suffer relatively lesser damage during a particular earthquake or during a particular seismic scenario such that these can be used, these, I mean uh, these are the alignment along which important roads can be laid. So, that in case of any distress these can be used for medical situation, situation, supply of essential items. essential items. So, all these information. Similarly, 
what are the relatively safer area relatively safer area within a study area of course this is when we say about relatively safer area so it is basically in terms of hazard values we have not taken particularly in microzonation study we have not taken the quality of construction based on which the building has been constructed so there might be possibility uh, area which is very uh, much prone to high hazard but depending upon the quality of construction which is very good the building may not experience any kind of damage or even minor cracks so this when we say about safety we are mainly focused on in terms of hazard values or hazard index more precisely because hazard index means collectively it will be taken into account what is the effect which is coming from bedrock what is the effect which is coming from uh, local side effect what is the effect which is coming from uh, induced effects also so collectively hazard index is going to give you a relative uh, uh, representation of potential hazards which might be because of one or more than one components of uh, surface scenario earthquake so microzonation study can help you in identifying locations for important buildings for important transmission towers even for laying important roads which can be used for supply of medicals supply of essential items in case of any distress any casualties and then identification of relatively safer areas uh, uh, within a particular study area so you can identify these are the location which are relatively safe if there is an earthquake going to hit in and around of your study area or within your seismotectonic province now starting with the so why actually uh, microzonation is required if we to take into account the understanding about earthquakes as i mentioned earlier also in india the primarily if we are focusing about uh, plate boundaries that is indian eurasian plate boundaries towards the north and indo burmese plate boundary towards the east the recording of earthquake roughly around 1960 1980s has actually started but if we look into the damages which have been available in uh, various forms in the existing literature the uh, in terms of casualties we can see in this particular figure so 1255 there was an earthquake in kathmandu valley the magnitude of the earthquake uh, uh, not uh, uh, very closer figure is known but if we talk in terms of fatalities it's it uh, it led to almost 1 lakh fatalities in 1255 so we we can think of like what was the population density in 1255 so that means relatively even though the population density was relatively less but whatever houses people were using had undergone maybe minor uh, major cracks or maybe complete collapse as a result almost close to 1250 uh, 1 lakh fatalities which were reported during 1255 earthquake similarly so so one side we are talking about how much we know about ground motion characteristics that means uh, in indian scenario after 1980 dharmshala earthquake but if we talk in terms of damage characteristics or how prone is the study area in terms of damages which are generated during different different earthquakes so here is a list of earthquakes the year in which these earthquakes have happened and the relative fatalities so 1255 earthquake in kathmandu and then 1555 again there was an earthquake in srinagar which caused almost 60000 fatalities 1737 there was an earthquake close to kolkata again the fatalities were close to 1 lakh 1819 there was an earthquake in uh, kutch also referred to as allahabad earthquake so the magnitude of that earthquake which later uh, was determined was close to 7.8 so uh, still if we if we think in terms of ground motion the great earthquakes we have very limited information and most of the information particularly in indian scenario is related to uh, the iso seismal map which are available when we are talking about uh, 1897 shillong earthquake you are talking about 1905 kangda earthquake 1950 assam earthquake and 1934 bihar uh, nepal earthquake so most of the earthquake which are above 8 magnitude which we call as great earthquakes have happened but as such we we do not have Uh, ground motion records for these great earthquakes particularly in the indian scenario however these understanding in terms of how much was the casualties at least gives us gives an idea about 
what if these earthquakes are going to get repeated, what will the amount of damages in the region. We know that in comparison to uh, uh, 1819, in comparison to 1833, the population density, if you are talking about seismic zone 5, is significantly high. Again, taking into account the construction uh, practice, which ranges from very poor to poor to very good construction. So, depending upon, so there are regions which are uh, which are actually prone to very large magnitude earthquakes, maybe major to great earthquakes also and the system which is going to offer resistance to the ground motion actually is ranging from very poor to very good construction. So, depending upon how much is the loading which is induced by earthquake and how much is the resistance which is being offered by the infrastructure definitely will decide what will be the fate of the infrastructure whether it will undergo complete collapse, whether it will be minor damages or whether it will be major damages. And depending upon the damage of the structure, that will define what will happen to the intended user of that particular structure. If the structure undergoes complete collapse and people are actually using it during a particular earthquake, definitely that will lead to larger casualties. It has also been observed that depending upon the time when the earthquake has happened, will also play a significant role in terms of casualties. That means, if the earthquake is happening when uh, uh, during daytime where majority of the people are not actually staying inside the house, but are in open area or maybe doing different activities which are not related to staying inside a particular building, even the building undergoes major damage or complete collapse in such scenario, the, the casualties will be relatively less in comparison to the times when the earthquakes are hitting and majority of the population is inside their house. Again, so 1819 there was an earthquake in Kutch leading to almost 1543 uh, uh, casualties. 1833 again there was earthquake in Bihar, Nepal causing close to 500 casualties. So, these are the rough figure which is taken from the literature. 1897 there was an earthquake in Shillong, close to 1500 casualties were there. And again, whenever we are discussing about casualties, we should also take into account what is the population density, how closely people are staying how closely are the houses. So, even one house undergoes collapse, there will be effect of that particular collapse to the nearby building. So, that, that will also be accounted. And 1905, there was an earthquake in Kangra of magnitude 7.8 and uh, the casualties were close to 19,500. 1934, again there was an earthquake after 19, uh, 1833, the magnitude of the earthquake was close to 8.1 led to almost 10,500 uh, casualties. 1950, again there was an earthquake in Assam of magnitude 8.5 uh, leading to 1526 casualties. And subsequently, 2005, there was an earthquake in Kashmir where the casualties primarily in uh, 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 close to 80,000 casualties were there. The, though the magnitude of the earthquake was again 6.7.6, 6, so we can have an understanding like if we directly correlate the casualties with respect to magnitude, there is significant variation. Many a times, major earthquakes are causing more damage in comparison to great earthquakes, primarily because the whether uh, population was available in that particular region, buildings were available in that particular region or not. So, collectively and thirdly, as I mentioned, the time, the time of the day when the earthquake has hit, where the majority of the population was. So, all these collectively will decide and of course, most important is the quality of the construction. So, quality of construction, quality of construction time of occurrence in terms of the day and intended user. If there are buildings, which buildings are very large, but intended users are very less, then certainly building damage will be more, but fatalities will be very less. Now, this, this if you if you focus on the year in which these have happened, starting from 1255, and this is not the complete picture. So, we have yet many more information which are to be, uh, which can be added up over here about like 2015, there was an earthquake in Nepal, close to 11,000 casualties and uh, close to that. And again, the, the economic damages 
economic loss was in billions of dollars. So, so it is not only about the casualties, but also the financial loss which the country has to suffer when, uh, ex when uh, lot of infrastructure failure undergoes during a particular earthquake scenario, because one has to spend again the same amount of money to, to, to develop the infrastructure to the level where it was before the earthquake has hit. So, here is the scenario that there is an area which has a long history of earthquake occurrence and subsequently fatalities. Now, we are talking about smart buildings, we are talking about smart cities. So, the primary objective is how one can identify the location which are more prone to earthquake and its induced damages and the location which are less prone to earthquake hazard and induced damages such that accordingly we can take this information in city planning as I mentioned in terms of uh, locating important buildings, in terms of uh, laying important roads, in terms of laying transmission towers and, and many more information. Again, if you talk about earthquakes which we, we have discussed, basically it is related to release of energy which, which has primarily been released at the focus or the source of the earthquake in terms of seismic waves. So, if we see here, just now in the previous slide we, we, we discussed about the building damages, but if we see the entire uh, problem here, it is there is a ground surface on which you are having a building. Somewhere maybe hundreds of kilometers away from your site of interest, there was release of energy at the focus. When the energy was released, there was development of seismic waves. These all important terminology we have already discussed in earlier lectures. Now, again if you go to a particular building, there will be local soil available. Beneath that particular soil, you can have bedrock. rock, you can have even weathered rock also and then crystal medium is there. So, seismic waves which are generated at the source will be propagating through crystal medium reaching to your again to the crystal medium and uh, subsequent to bedrock. Once it reaches to the bedrock, these come in contact with surface layer or near surface layer. So, depending upon the dynamic properties of these surface layers and how much shear strain is getting induced by a particular ground motion in each of these subsurface layers. Number of layers are possible between bedrock and the ground surface. So, depending upon the dynamic properties of each of these layers, dynamic properties of each of these layers of soil and even bedrock medium. The medium has actually been exposed to change in the motion characteristics or more precisely ground motion characteristics. Remember we are we are discussing now in terms of what are the locations which can be declared as relatively safe for further construction. So, so, so waves started from the focus reach to a particular site depending upon the dynamic properties as well as as well as induced shear strain. We remember dynamic soil properties. So, finally, what properties of the soil, what property of shear modulus, what property of damping ratio will govern the response of the soil will be depend upon how much shear strain is getting induced in the particular soil layer. So, if, if the shear strain is relatively high, then corresponding to that level of shear strain, the subsequent value of damping ratio and modulus uh, uh, shear modulus will take part in controlling on or in offering resistance to the ground shaking. Subsequently, this phenomena will keep on getting repeated to different different layers. Finally, there will be ground motion which is reaching to the ground surface. Now, one is this ground motion reaching at the surface, it is basically giving uh, how much is the earthquake loading which is being transferred to the foundation of the building, subsequently to the superstructure also. But at the same time, if the ground which is available at the particular site, like we are talking about this particular ground on which the foundation is located, if the ground is soft, cohesionless, saturated, it can also cause loss of shear strength. That means, there will be development of excess pore pressure, it will lead to liquefaction in the medium. 
So, even though the building the superstructure is designed corresponding the potential designed corresponding to potential input motion corresponding to potential input motion input earthquake loading which has been obtained based on surface energy of the earthquake or after local side effect est uh, estimation. So, building remain in intact, but what will happen if the foundation soil has undergone liquefaction the building will undergo either too much of total settlement or it may undergo too much of differential settlement. Finally, liquefaction leading to leading to excessive total or or differential settlement differential settlement. So, building remain intact, but again so building remain int intact remember when we were talking about earthquake loading on a particular building it was combined effect of bedrock motion and amplification by the local soil building remain intact, but at the same time the foundation medium which was offering resistance to bearing capacity of the foundation has actually lost all the strength it is almost like a liquid building remain intact, but has actually started sinking into the ground. It may undergo uniform settlement or it may undergo differential settlement. In such a case even though the building was intact, but now it is not making its sole purpose of I mean sole purpose. So, it will be considered as failed as far as serviceability is concerned. So, again so one was bedrock motion bedrock motion we are trying to highlight what are the uh, characteristics which are basically defining the safety of this particular building independent of the quality of the construction because we have not taken the building classification and its intended use. So, we are not right now uh, focusing on uh, the vulnerability and risk we are only focusing on the hazard part. So, bedrock motion was there then soil amplification was there. This independently we have discussed, but at a particular site bedrock motion that is obtained from seismic hazard analysis. So, we are having some value of hazard now depending upon different values of hazard what is the amplification as we discussed earlier also low value of uh, uh, PGA or low value of bedrock motion can give you higher amplification, but as the amplitude of bedrock motion keeps on increasing the soil amplification will keep on reducing because the soil is dynamic in nature in terms of offering resistance to external loading. So, soil amplification came into picture this collectively defined the design of superstructure of superstructure of course, we will take into account the soil structure interaction also here. Now, soil exposed to loading exposed to which loading the modified ground motion at the surface because if you remember when we are discussing about uh, liquefaction potential of a site the A max value was surface motion corresponding peak ground acceleration values. So, soil exposed to loading this will define whether liquefaction or not liquefaction or no liquefaction. So, even though the building remains safe if the soil has undergone liquefaction it will start excessive settlement. So, this is third part this is basically local side effect was also leading to uh, excessive ground shaking local again uh, the surface motion or the occurrence of liquefaction it is also called as induced effect. So, whenever we are discussing about a microzonation or hazard index which will be the basis for microzonation we will be taking into account the direct loading as well as the induced effects. So, in this particular case it is liquefaction if again if we are talking about hilly terrain. So, there will be chances that the slope may undergo failure because of induced loading by ground motions during a particular earthquake. So, again this can destabilize the slope the slope can undergo failure. So, similar to uh, assessing the factor of safety against liquefaction one can also look into the landslide zonation map of a particular uh, region 
where the slopes which are on the brink of failure, the slope which are relatively safe, which are marginally safe are actually well identified and at times the factor of safety against failure for scenario earthquakes are also been defined. So, taking that into account when we are talking about hilly terrain, we can also take into account the landslide susceptibility, susceptibility that means what is the susceptibility that the site can undergo landslide failure because again though the building is intact corresponding to a surface loading or modified ground motion at the surface, if the land on which the building is located or the land adjacent to the building undergoes any kind of landslide definitely it is going to compromise the exist the very existence of the building. So, again this is induced effect. So, far we have taken again I am repeating so far we have taken uh, the seismic hazard value, local side effect and induced effects individually in earlier lectures, but in seismic micro donation we are actually interested to find out what are the regions which are which can be declared as relatively safer in terms of hazard values or hazard index. So, again hilly terrain this is there again you are talking about coastal region you can bring tsunami into account if you are talking about maybe uh, uh, any other kind of terrain. So, what are the potential induced effects which may come into picture whenever we are talking about earthquake scenarios or how the system in the local region is going to uh, respond to earthquake loading very much similar to liquefaction, landslide, tsunami or even there is chances like fire can break out during a particular earthquake. We can bring that component into account and try finding out what will be the relatively uh, lower hazard index locations or relatively higher hazard index locations in uh, micro donation map development. So, this was the modified ground motion at the surface which is basically controlling the shaking of the building, but in addition this is also controlling the, uh, the chances that the soil can undergo liquefaction at that particular foundation level. So, modified ground motion leading to failure again if we see there is significant change in the Modify uh, the ground motion characteristics between bedrock within the soil as well as on the ground surface. We have discussed all these things individually also earlier. So, what is happening at the source will be called as source characteristics happening between the source and the site that is called as propagation path characteristics and what is happening at the site can be called as path characteristics. Now, this is the background in actual uh, uh, at actual site what we see some building is there and after a particular earthquake if the building has undergone damage. So, we can make a comparison between what was the building before how was the building before earthquake and how is the building after earthquake. So, collectively this is the combined effect of source propagation path and site characteristics which is basically defining the level of uh, ground shaking or the amplitude of ground shaking which the building is exposed to or probable level of ground shaking the which a building is exposed to primarily during its design life. Again ground motion, so we have discussed already ground motion and attenuation we can bring in collectively in ground motion prediction equation which can be used in determining hazard analysis and then based on field investigation one can go for liquefaction and site classification maps. We cannot avoid the information that earthquake directly is not causing any kind of damage rather it is the response whether you are talking about liquefaction, it is the response of the ground to earthquake loading when you are talking about building damage, landslide again it is the response of the system to the loading which has been induced by or which has been given by because of earthquake occurrence. Now, if we are able to find out maybe regional hazard values, bedrock level, surface level definitely it will help in giving updated information about earthquake loading for which a building a system has to be designed. Again if you are talking about landslide it is going to give you how much is the earthquake loading for which a particular slope can be exposed to determine the factor of safety of that particular slope and appropriately take decision whether there is a, uh, there is a need to strengthen the slope or there is a need to provide some, some secondary measure. So, that even if it undergoes failure there will not be subsequent effect in terms of intended user on the slope or adjacent to the slope. The main uh, reason there is fast growing population which has actually started uh, settling in the regions which are may be moderate to very high seismic hazard zones. If the earthquakes which 
which were triggered almost close to a 1 lakh 80,000, uh, 1 lakh or 80,000 fatalities in 1200, 1500s. If we are talking about buildings or, or the regions which are having maybe close to 1 lakh, 2 lakh uh, people living in very closer areas and now exposed to moderate to major earthquake and of course, build, uh, I mean in 1200, 1300 mostly it was like single story buildings or like ground floor people were living. We are all also talking about poor construction practice and buildings are becoming higher and higher. So, taking that effect also into account, poor construction practice, high population density, that means one thing is clear, if such similar uh, seismic scenario is going to get repeated, the casualties, the fatalities, the amount of damages, the economic loss will be many, many fold in comparison to what has been witnessed in the past. So, they, this highlights that a more comprehensive study should be done, particularly in seismically um, active regions which are there in seismic zone 3, seismic zone 4 and 5 as far as uh, the seismic zonation map of India is concerned. Because based on this comprehensive studies, firstly the district authorities will be able to identify regions which are relatively safe. Secondly, because once the maps are available for micro zonation studies, maps are available, this is also going to give you a guidelines to uh, to intended user which are thinking of maybe some uh, construction projects or maybe laying of uh, a runway for, for uh, uh, airport or maybe for laying important railway lines. So, certainly additional information we are now giving based on micro zonation maps like these are the locations if your railway track, if your uh, uh, runway or if your road is passing through one has to take extra precaution. And please see if there is any kind of ground improvement need, please do it because this is a location which is basically prone to earthquake effects. So, not only the hazard value, but also taking into account the induced effects. If that can be taken into account, definitely it will help in mitigation, it can help in significant reduction of seismic hazard values and uh, the corresponding casualties. Some facts. Uh, this is basically uh, uh, related to Indian scenario. So, we can see 4000 natural calamities has happened in last decade killing more than close to 8 lakh people and close to 2 billion people getting affected by the natural calamities. We are talking about in terms of tsunami, in terms of earthquake, in terms of fire breakout, in terms of avalanche, in terms of landslides and many more things. However, if we are talking about all this, a major portion comes from earthquakes. That means, in terms of building damage, in terms of casualties, earthquake has been playing a dominating role. And uh, if we are talking about tsunami, the, the casualties will be more confined to coastal region. If we are talking about landslide, again it will be more confined to hilly terrain. But as far as earthquake is concerned, it is more or less causing damages to each type of terrain. terrain. That means, independent of whether you are talking about coastal region, you are talking about hilly terrain, you are talking about plain areas, earthquake and induced effects are possible in all types of terrain. That is the reason majority of the damages which have been, which have happened actually in uh, uh, earlier earthquakes are basically uh, having contribution significantly from earthquakes in comparison to other natural calamities. Again, if you are talking about economic losses more than 1000 dollars of economic losses primarily because of these casualties has happened. So, we are not only talking about fatalities, but also the, the finance which is getting lost while dealing with these casualties whether in terms of rehabilitation, whether in terms of medical supplies, whether in terms of uh, constructing infrastructure. So, that one can reach to affected areas. So, economic loss is also involved. Threats by 2050 because of these particular uh, natural calamities particularly in India will be manifold as per uh, will be uh, three times higher as per uh, World Bank report. So, this, this gives an indication like if we are talking about the casualties at present which are in terms of th tens of thousands or 1 lakh during even single earthquakes uh, collectively and in terms of economic loss also sometime it reaches close to billions of dollars by 2050 it is going to get significantly higher. So, that means there is a requirement that a more comprehensive study in primarily in terms of micro zonation, 
which takes collectively into account all the parameters which are basically governing the surface scenario of uh, hazard values in terms of induced effects, in terms of other effects. So, so that we can minimize these casualties, we, we can minimize these catastrophes. So, if, if we are able to take into account the chances the site can undergo landslide, it can undergo liquefaction, it can undergo excessive ground shaking, soil amplification, all these potential uh, probabilities if, if we are taking into account well in advance, we can uh, stand in the slope, we can stand in the site, we can uh, uh, appropriately uh, determine the earthquake loading on a building such that the casualties or the catastrophes which are likely to come can be minimized significantly. This will have improvising significantly in terms of economic losses. So, we can, we can uh, strengthen our infrastructure rather than waiting for some uh, seismic scenario to hit the infrastructure and leading to damage. Similarly, we can also reduce significantly the casualties which are likely to occur because we cannot ignore what has been what has been learned during uh, uh, previous earthquakes which, which we saw in the beginning of this particular lecture. So, microzonation it was uh, the term uh, microzonation is defined as zonation with respect to ground motion characteristics. So, we will take ground motion characteristics into account taking source and site conditions also into account. So, we will be taking into what are the site conditions and how the site conditions are going to get affected when the site is being exposed to earthquake loading condition. Also taking into account what is the what has been generated at the source and getting propagated to the site and primarily in terms of. Uh, so, if you are talking about seismic microzonation we can say zonation with respect to ground motion characteristics. So, it is more, more like seismic microzonation. So, it has been defined as per International Society for Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering Technical Committee 4 in the year 1999. The purpose why we are one, one should go for microzonation because it is going to give you an overall understanding of a particular site in order to take in, in order to go for mitigation what mitigation measures can be done in order to plan for rehabilitation at least if, if a particular site or a particular town which has not been uh, developed based on uh, in a very planned manner, but if uh, microzonation maps are available still we can be better prepared for any kind of rehabilitation work which might be required maybe in the next 5 years, 10 years, 20 years from now such that if we, we are ready with those rehabilitation plan we can deal with such calamities, such distressful condition in more effective manner. So, the during a particular earthquake and also after a particular earthquake in terms of rehabilitation. Of course, if we are uh, designing a particular region, it will be uh, the microzonation maps play a very important role in terms of city planning, again to assess vulnerability studies and even for risk assessment, primarily because microzonation is giving uh, a bigger picture of particular site, how the site overall is going to behave during a particular earthquake. Now, it can be collectively because of bedrock motion, it can be because of amplification, it can be because of landslide, it can be because of local soil, it can be because of uh, overburden or it can be because of predominant frequency of the site itself. So, all these features which are directly contributing to the, the scenario which can be created at a particular site during a particular earthquake is all is, everything is going inside a particular uh, uh, microzonation map. So, some of the cities which I, which I have mentioned over here for which microzonation studies have been completed or and some it is also undergoing. So, it is not the first uh, uh, I mean the, the study for microzonation maps has been happening in for number of cities for some uh, cities more than uh, one attempt have been done to understand the microzonation of the study area and this can further be used primarily in vulnerability and risk assessment. Now, components of microzonation, so here we are discussing about microzonation map, how it can be developed. Now, there are different inputs which are required and corresponding to these inputs, there will be some output which may be acting as input for next level. So, whenever we are discussing about micro uh, seismic hazard, uh, whether you are going with deterministic or probabilistic one one has to take into account what is the geology of a particular region, 
then develop what is the seismotectonic map of a particular region taking the past uh, earthquake as well as information about the seismic sources into account. Also take regional ground motion prediction equation. So, you will be having information about the geology, you will be having information about the tectonic setting of the region which definitely will help in seismic source characterization of a particular region. Taking that into account, one can determine the seismic activity of a particular region. Again bringing the source information and past earthquake information, we can go with development of seismotectonic map. So, one we have seismotectonic map, other we have source characterization map. Taking these information, primarily the, the maximum magnitude, minimum magnitude which is potential in a particular region, these, these we have already discussed in earlier lectures. So, here the those inputs which we have discussed earlier are also component of microzonation maps. Again taking regional ground motion prediction equation, taking probabilistic model or deterministic model, one can develop hazard map that is seismic hazard map of a particular study area. This can be used to identify what are the regions which are more vulnerable as far as the seismic hazard is concerned. It can also be helpful in determining the bedrock level hazard maps and even for determination of uniform hazard spectra if you are going with probabilistic model. Now, this hazard value is definitely at bedrock level. So, definitely at some level this hazard value will be will come in contact with the local soil. So, one can go with seismic site classification to find out on an average what is the characteristic of a medium, whether the medium is very soft, whether the medium is soft, it is relatively soft, uh, stiff or it is hard. So, one can go with geotechnical method like standard penetration test, cone penetration test, uh, uh, cross hole uh, test or we can go with maybe geophysical method like multi channel analysis of surface waves, spectral analysis of surface wave which will also give an understanding about strength properties of subsurface medium. It will also help in identifying overall what is the classification in which a particular side belongs to. So, this will give you if if, if the depth of bedrock is relatively shallower, even geophysical method can help in identifying the depth of bedrock. If it is uh, located at relatively deeper depth, we can go with more precise methods. So, based on the exploration uh, which are done based on geotechnical or geophysical methods, one can develop seismic site classification maps. That means, identification of regions which are identified, which are classified as relatively safe which are identified as relatively stiff, which are identified as relatively hard in a particular study area. So, you go to a particular site, do these tests and depending upon the output, you can classify. So, there are classification system one can refer to and based on that, based on SPTN value, based on shear wave velocity, one can classify a particular site. So, bedrock motion has given you an understanding about what is the amplitude of motion which are going to develop at bedrock across your study area. Site classification has given overburden, what is the characteristics of the overburden, whether it is soft, whether it is hard, whether it is stiff. Now, considering the subsoil characteristics and the input motion, one can perform ground response analysis or site response analysis, taking bedrock into account, taking bedrock motion into account, depth of bedrock into account, dynamic properties of the soil into account as well as the stratification details into account. So, all these information will go into the site response analysis, you can do maybe linear analysis, equivalent linear or non-linear analysis which has already been discussed in earlier lectures. This will help in developing surface hazard maps. The deterministic and probabilistic uh, uh, maps which were developed over here were at bedrock level, but after ground response analysis you are getting surface hazard maps. This will also help in determining amplification maps corresponding to different different scenarios, what are the sites which are undergoing more amplification, what are the sites undergoing lesser amplification and subsequently because these are the sites having different different stiffness across the depths. So, there will be one can also de develop the predominant frequency maps. So, based on the geotechnical and geophysical methods whatever stiffness value we are getting that can be used to determine the predominant frequency of the particular site use the same observation for number of sites, one can develop the predominant frequency maps for the study area. So, now we are having surface maps, surface uh, seismic hazard maps which is basically going to give you 
how much is the expected level of ground motion at the surface. Based on geophysical and geotechnical methods, we are also having strength characteristics of in situ soil. So, strength characteristics we are getting from here, stress characteristics we are getting from here. Comparing these two using standard terminologies, one can also find out using scenario earthquake into account, using corrected SPT into account, which has also been discussed when we were discussing about liquefaction potential of a site and taking the surface p ground acceleration into account, one can determine the factor of safety of a particular site or susceptibility of a site whether it will undergo liquefaction or it will not. So, collectively we will get factor of safety against liquefaction maps of a particular area. So, once this map is available, we will be able to find out what are the locations if favorable loading conditions which, which are behind those maps. then these are the location which are potential to undergo liquefaction considering the current in situ condition. If someone is going for construction, one can refer to those methods, uh, maps and maybe can go for suitable ground improvement measures before uh, constructing of any particular sites. So, a particular site whether it is exposed to very high bedrock motion, whether the site belongs to soft soil site, whether the soil amplification is relatively high or the soil has very low value of factor of safety against liquefaction, any of these parameters can collectively define what will be the effect of earthquake or it, its induced effects on the particular site. So, collectively taking the components which we are getting from each of these thematic layers and we can add up more layers depending upon what are the potential induced effects which are likely to occur at a particular site of interest for which one is developing the microzonation map. Collectively taking all those into account in rational manner because all are not given equal importance. So, some will be giving relatively higher weightages, some will be giving relatively lower weightages. One can club all those thematic layers and develop microzonation maps. Now, we will be referring here about some study which have been done. So, this is particularly related to one published paper. So, we are here we can see the, the seismotectonic map which is developed for Lucknow, we can see here Lucknow is located and what are the important faults in and around of Lucknow within uh, radial distance of 350 kilometers. And then these are the regions which are showing dense, it, dense uh, uh, like the past earthquake information is densely available there or past earthquake epicenters are densely located over there. Based on this uh, one can develop seismic tectonic map and using this seismotectonic map take in uh, uh, the duration of completeness, magnitude of completeness and seismic activity which has been discussed in earlier lectures, one can develop. So, this has been taken from Kumari 12 2013, one can develop probabilistic hazard map. So, here are two typical maps related to probabilistic hazard, uh, probabilistic seismic hazard analysis of Lucknow again. The first one is corresponding to 2 percent probability in 50 years. So, we can see in this particular location 0 0.07 g is the seismic hazard which is which, which has 98 percent probability that it is not going to get exceeded in next 50 years. Similarly, if you go with the second map which is again the probabilistic seismic hazard map of Lucknow considering 10 percent probability in 50 years, we can see the same site which was exposed and giving 0 0.07 g, it is basically now giving us relatively higher value of 0, I mean lower value of 0 0.02, 0 0.045 g. So, this is going to give you an understanding about the bedrock level hazard values. Again one can go with geotechnical and geophysical uh, measurements. So, one can refer to uh, uh, the TC4 ISMG guidelines which are which are to be referred to or even NDMA National Disaster Management Authority, they have given also guidelines related to. Uh, selection of grid size as far as one is going for a seismic cla site classification for microzonation studies. So, depending upon the area in which your uh, site is located, if your site is located in seismic source zone, uh, seismic zone 3 or 4 or 5 as per seismic zonation map of India, as the site is belonging to heterogeneous or homogeneous medium, we can select suitable grid size to perform at least one geotechnical and geophysical test. Using those, one can develop microzonation uh, 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 this site classification map. So, again here we can see referring to site classes, 
these are the location which are belonging to set class E. Again, if you are going with a shear wave velocity, these are the location belonging to set class uh, C and these are the location which are belonging to set class D. So, some location which are belonging to set class E and D are identified based on uh, in situ site investigation. Again, uh, using the bedrock motion as well as local site effect, one can do ground response analysis and find out how much is the surface scenario. One can also find out how much is the average amplification because soil remains the same at a particular site, but input motion can vary from very low PGA to very large uh, PGA. So, average amplification, maximum amplification and then corresponding to average amplification what is the surface scenario or uh, surface seismic hazard scenario and based on maximum amplification what is the surface scenario which basically will be given as an input for uh, liquefaction understanding. Again liquefaction we, we know liquefaction states like development of excess pore pressure where the soil will lose all of its strength and almost flow like a liquid. The characteristics for identifying potentially liquefied sites we have already been discussed earlier. So, using this one can develop using in situ properties and uh, applying different correlation with respect to SPT values. One can uh, find out the, critic, the cyclic stress ratio, cyclic resistance ratio and finally, the factor of safety against liquefaction can be determined. So, using this one can develop maps which are showing what are the regions which are potential to undergo liquefaction, what are the regions which are having relatively higher value of factor of safety against liquefaction. So, these are again based on average uh, PJ, uh, average surface PJ value and based on maximum amplification for the same city. Again, this is a case study. So, this, this uh, findings if we have more because these findings as far as liquefaction is concerned were based on limited information about subsoil exploration. So, uh, if more information related to subsoil or borehole information are there, this information can be updated. Now, hazard index. So, hazard index means basically you are trying to finalize in terms of some index value which will give you collective effect of PJ value, amplification, uh, average 30 meter uh, soil classification. Additional parameter which we took into account here is based on 760 meter per second we identify the region which are belonging to relatively stiffer medium. Then factor of safety against liquefaction, predominant frequency. So, basically 6 parameters have been identified which which can affect the surface scenario during a particular earthquake. Taking all these 6 parameters, one can assign ranks. That means, here we can see PJ it is going to, it should be given higher importance because higher PJ it is going to affect more and it is basically directly the effect of uh, earthquake to the particular site of interest. Second is amplification. So, that is next which is giving higher uh, 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 factor or rank, then uh, stiffness of the medium, then depth to 760 meter per second uh, medium, then factor of safety, then predominant frequency. Again, these are the actual weights. So, normalized weight you can say like taking all other parameter, what is the normalized weight corresponding to PGA. There are different methodology, I am not uh, highlighting any methodology here. So, uh, so, this is relatively, so again over here also normalized weights corresponding to different different parameters, all 6 parameters these are the normalized weights. Again very much similar to the ranks which are given over here, we can have like PJ value for uh, Lucknow varying from 0 0.05 to any value uh, maybe 0 0.12. So, this value of PJ again divided into different different ranges, higher is the PJ that is given higher rank. Again if you see over here the entire range of PJ is divided into 4 categories. So, again we can find out what is the relative weight corresponding to each of these categories. So, normalized weights and this collectively will help in finding out how much is the hazard index for the particular site of interest. We can see over here this is the weight multiply this particular weight which is corresponding to this thematic layer of bedrock PGA. Then there will be a weight corresponding to how much is the PGA over here. So, this 0.286 multiply with that particular weight of PGA depending upon the value of PGA which is mentioned over here plus 0.238 multiply by 
depending upon the amplification value at that particular site of interest that will, there will be a weight. So, 0 0.238 into multiply by the weights of site amplification which has been uh, defined in the previous slide plus 0 0.190 into uh, weights of site class which is defined in the previous plus 0 0.143 into how much is the uh, VS760 corresponding uh, uh, value which is defined over here and subsequently to other sites. So, if we add up all those contributions 0 0.286, 0 0.238, 0 0.190, 0 0.143, 0 0.095 and 0 0.048, it sums up to 1. That means, we have taken the contribution from each of these thematic layers and the total contribution is coming as 100 percent. Out of that 100 percent, 0.286 or 28.6 percent is coming from BADOC PJ, 23.86 is coming from amplification and subsequently like this. Add up those, we will get the micro donation map. So, this is basically in terms of hazard values. So, you can see higher hazard that means, those are the region which are showing you that relatively those are the locations which, which are showing more effects of earthquakes, whether it is bedrock or because of induced effects. So, this is based, based on deterministic hazard values, this is based on 2 percent probability uh, bedrock motion and the corresponding hazard values and this is corresponding to 10 percent probability. So, we can see these are the regions which are relatively showing higher hazards and these are the regions which are showing relatively lower hazards, these are the regions which are showing relatively medium hazards in a particular study area. So, if, if this kind of map is there that is going to definitely give you more inputs about how one can proceed as far as city planning is concerned and uh, laying off important roads, hospitals is concerned. So, this is about the micro zonation. As I mentioned this, I have given an overview about one case studies. Depending upon the area, depending upon uh, uh, additional information available like geology is there, maybe tectonic setting is there, maybe path attenuation is there, those can be given more uh, additional thematic layers as far as the micro zonation map development is concerned. So, thank you everyone, this is all related to the micro donation uh, studies for uh, a particular study area. Thank you.